Warning, the video you're about to watch contains mathematics at the level of college algebra and trigonometry. All material has an assumed prerequisite of both Algebra 1, which is elementary algebra, and Algebra 2, which is intermediate algebra. While some prerequisite topics are reviewed briefly, a more thorough review of these entrance topics can be found by searching the web. It's the system of equations. We must deal with them all at once. Always looking for solutions. Positive outlook overcomes. Hello, my name is Roy Simpson, professor of mathematics at Cosumnes River College in Sacramento, California. This is a continuation to an introduction to trigonometry for a student taking a college algebra with trigonometry course or just a trig course, a first course in trig in college. So you should have already watched my videos on angles and you should already know what a radian angle is and how to convert between degrees and radians. Uh, arc length is gonna be important for this conversation. Also right triangle trig. All my videos on right triangle trig up to this point are gonna be required to be able to understand what I'm gonna be talking about here. So here comes the second definition of trigonometric functions. Now I said in a previous video, there are actually three definitions, but I'm reducing them down to two definitions. The first being the right triangle definition of trigonometric functions. And the second being the unit circle definition. They are equivalent definitions. They're just based on different perspectives. That's all, but they are mathematically equivalent. So let's start with what is a unit circle? Well, the circle centered at the origin with radius one is called a unit circle. Something like this it goes through one zero and zero one, uh, negative one comma zero and zero comma negative one, right? So we know from our algebra, the equation of this is x squared plus y squared is equal to one. Again, that's because it's centered at the origin and it has radius one. That's going to become critical as we move forward that you understand that equation x squared plus y squared is equal to one. That's totally the relation for a circle. Now, the next thing we're going to need is a definition for a terminal point. Again, we're building up to a trigonometric function definition here, but you do need a lot of this language at first to get there. So the terminal point, uh, let's define it and then show a picture of it. The point x, y located a distance of t measured counterclockwise along the circumference of the unit circle from the point one zero is called the terminal point determined by t. So let's take a look at what I mean by all that mumbo jumbo. So we're given a circle of radius one on the Cartesian coordinate system. And we're going to start at the point one comma zero. Again, that's what the definition is telling us to do. We start at the point. Let me go ahead and get the right highlighter here. One comma zero. And we're going to rotate counterclockwise along the circumference of the unit circle here. Technically, we do not have to rotate counterclockwise, but just like angles open counterclockwise, so do uh, these arc lengths. So I'm going to draw out an arc length here, maybe just up to this point. Let's just park it right here. That's where it ends. And so that point we'll call P of X, Y. And this distance along the arc we'll call T. That point is then the terminal point determined by T. That's all it means. It just means I kind of walk along this edge of this circle until I hit the point P and I have gone a distance T. Therefore, that point P is the terminal point of T. That's all. That's all that's this definition really truly means. So let's go ahead and plot the terminal point on the unit circle associated with T equals negative seven pi over six. This example is selected specifically to showcase what we need to know about the unit circle. So let's talk about this. T is negative, first of all, which means our arc is actually, or our length along the circumference of this circle is gonna go clockwise. Negative uh, distances along an arc are the same as how angles work. They go negative in the clockwise direction. So let me just highlight that here. We're going along this arc. 
And I say I want us to go a distance along this arc of negative seven pi over six. Well, the question is, what is the actual distance around this entire unit circle? And we've done this before. It is a requirement that you've already watched my other videos, specifically the video on arc length and radian measure. I have two different videos on that. And from those videos, we happen to know that the circumference, uh, we also know this from your pre-algebra class, but the circumference of a circle is two pi r. But with a unit circle, the radius is one. So the full distance around is two pi. Great. And so if I go all the way, not all the way, but halfway around, I will have cut out a distance of negative pi, right? Because we're going in the negative direction here. So this is negative pi. In terms of that denominator, which is six here, let me highlight that that negative pi can be written as negative six pi over six. Just really, it's like pi, but we've gone six pi over six, which is pi, but negative. Well, we wanna go to negative seven pi over six. So obviously we have to go just a little bit more. So this distance right there looks to be t equals negative seven pi over six. That is the arc along the curve of length negative seven pi over six. I shouldn't say length. I should just say that's T equals negative seven pi over six. Now bringing in what we've talked about previously, we also know that that is the actual angle we've rotated through. So not only is it the arc length, but it is also the angle that we've rotated through in radians. That angle is a negative seven pi over six radians. And we're asked to plot the terminal point on the unit circle associated with t is equal to negative seven pi over six. So plotting the point is just not enough for me. I'd like to actually label that point if I could. So to label that point, I'd like to know what this y value is and what this x value is. And if you note from my picture, that is a right triangle. Now, we have gone backwards a negative 6 pi over 6 and a little bit more, a single pi over 6 more. Now, this should ring a bell to you. We have a right triangle, and our right triangle has a, obviously, right angle in it. It's also got this pi over 6. It's got this pi over 3. It's our special triangle. One, two, root three is the ratio that we would normally deal with. Those are the side lengths I would normally write down. However, this is a unit circle. So I need to take all those numbers and divide them by two. I need to shrink this, scale this down by a factor of two. So if I do that, that two will become a one, this one will become a one half, and this root three will become a root three over two. Now notice the X value is in quadrant, or the point is in quadrant two. So therefore, the X value here should be a negative X value, not a positive root three over two, but a negative root three over two. The Y value should be positive because it's above the X axis. It should be a positive one half. So notice I'm using my special triangles to help me out plotting that point that has carved out an arc. It's the terminal point of t equals negative seven pi over six, but I'm using my right triangle, that my special right triangles to uh, find the x and y values for that point. That's gonna be a skill that we will develop as we move forward. But this idea showcases something that you may have already known maybe from a previous course, but the points on the unit circle, some very special ones specifically like this one, are ratios um, that are common to trigonometric, tr trigonometric functions. We have seen the one halves and the negative root threes over, the, over twos, at least root threes over twos uh, before. But now we can redefine our trigonometric functions to be 
more than just based on a right triangle sitting alone in space. We can now define them in terms of a Cartesian coordinate system via the unit circle. And here is that big beefy definition for this. Let T be a real number and P be the terminal point on the unit circle determined by T. Okay, so that basically means we have a unit circle and we're carving out a distance along it and that distance along it is called T. We define the trigonometric functions of T to be the following. The sine of T will be Y. Again, this is for this point P of X, Y. So the sine will be the y value. The cosine will be the x value. The tangent will be y over x. The cosecant, as we know, it's the reciprocal of the sine is one over y. The secant still is the reciprocal of the cosine. It's one over x. And the cotangent, yep, that's still the reciprocal of the tangent. It's x over y. And these are also known as the circular functions because they're based on the unit circle. Now I want to allay any type of concerns here because some people will look at this and they'll say, um, oh my gosh, do I have to memorize two definitions for trigonometric functions? The answer to that is no, not at all. It's just that if you only deal with right triangle trigonometry, that will only work so far in mathematics. You need to somehow translate that to the Cartesian coordinate system so that we can start dealing with graphs of trigonometric functions and all that fun stuff. So to do that, we need to kind of marry together the Cartesian coordinate system, points X and Y, with our trig functions. But they're actually the same definitions, and I'll show you. So recall the arc length formula is S equals R theta, where S is the length along the arc. In our case, we've been calling it T in this video, so we'll just call this T for now. T, the arc length, is equal to the radius of the circle times theta. However, if R, the radius of the circle, is 1, because we have the unit circle, then T, because that's what we're doing in our case, is just equal to the angle. And I mentioned that a few moments ago, that that negative 7 pi over 6 arc was actually the angle in radians, negative, negative 7 pi over 6. Since T is the length of the zooming out the arc along the unit circle, T must equal theta. Thus, this definition is the same as our right triangle definition, but with the added benefit of working for non-acute angles. Our right triangle definition only works for angles less than 90 degrees. But once you step outside of triangles and you go into a circle, you can deal with angles any size you want, even negative angles. Now, I do want to, again, convince you that this is our same old uh, trig functions that we've seen before. So let me go ahead and draw out a unit circle here and just convince you. So here's my unit circle and I have some point up here and I'm just putting it in quadrant one just because it's easier to have that conversation with a point in quadrant one. But to be very honest with you, I could have put this point really anywhere. But notice, our definition of trig functions up here tells me that the sine of this arc T, let me go ahead and highlight the arc that I'm talking about, this arc right here, that the sine of that T is supposed to be Y. And we look at that and say, wait a second, that's not how I learned it. I learned the sine of the angle is opposite over hypotenuse, right? So the question is, is that opposite over hypotenuse? That's really the question is that equal to the opposite of the over the hypotenuse? Well, remember, in a unit circle, the angle and the arc are the same. So that arc length T is the same as the angle T in radians. And so I could technically draw in a right triangle here. And if you zoom into that right triangle and you consider that this is the horizontal, so the adjacent side to the angle the, uh, T, I'm so used to saying theta. So we know the sine of T will be opposite over hypotenuse, but in this case, the opposite is the Y value. In the hypotenuse, this is a circle of radius one. So the hypotenuse is one. So 
If you took opposite over hypotenuse, you'd get y over one, which is actually y. So the answer to your question, is that the same as opposite over hypotenuse? The answer is totally yes. By the way, the horizontal distance is just the x value for that point. And so they have de defined the cosine of t to be x, if you uh, consider t an arc length here. But honestly, that is adjacent over hypotenuse because the adjacent side to t is x and the hypotenuse is one. And finally, the tangent of t, they define that to be y over x, and we know it to be opposite over hypotenuse from right triangle trigonometry, or sorry, opposite over adjacent. Sorry about that. Some people just lost their mind. So the opposite is of t is y, and the adjacent side to t is x. And that is actually the same. So there's no difference between right triangle trigonometry and unit circle trigonometry other than one very important detail. T can be any number I want. Whereas in a right triangle, our angle can go only up to, but not including 90 degrees. And that's an issue. So now we're allowed the freedom to deal with any angle we want. And this opens up the door to a lot of cool trigonometry. So let's start by computing all trigonometric functions of t, given that t terminates, or in other words, stops in quadrant three, and the x value for t is one fourth. And that should be actually a negative one fourth because x in quadrant three would be negative. So let me write in negative one fourth there. That would have been a tragic mistake on my part. So there's my unit circle. And we're going to go ahead and open up an arc length so that it ends or terminates in quadrant three. They didn't actually tell us it's a positive arc length. It doesn't have to be actually, as long as it ends in quadrant three. But I'm going to go ahead and carve this out as if it was ending, if as if the arc length was positive and it was ending in quadrant three. So let's just get to, let's say right around here. All right, and I'm gonna plot a point right there. That point is P of, well, let's see, they told me the X value for that terminal point is negative one fourth, not one fourth, but negative one fourth. And we don't know the Y value. And that we're asked to find all of the trigonometric functions of this distance T, which again, it's gonna be the same as the angle T on a unit circle, okay? If the circle grows, the angle and the arc length are not the same. Um, that angle will actually remain the same, to be honest with you. So if this were, let's just pretend um, 200 degrees, which it's not, but let's just pretend, then if you explode the circle a little bit, the angle still is 200 degrees. Uh, but the arc length, if you make the circle larger, would just get bigger. So the arc length will change, but the angle will not. So the only time the angle in radians is the same as the arc length is when you're on a unit circle. That's why unit circle trig is so important. All right. So we want to find all the trigonometric functions of this. Well, that requires us finding Y, but luckily we have a relationship with X. We have a relationship between X and Y, sorry x squared plus y squared is equal to one on the unit circle, which makes it very easy to compute. Negative one fourth being squared plus y squared is equal to one. That is y squared is equal to one minus one sixteenth. Or in other words, y squared is equal to 15 sixteenths. Or in other words, y is equal to plus or minus the square root of 15 over four. So we have two options for what y could be when x is one fourth. It could either be a positive 15 fourths, which would put it up here, or a negative 15 fourths, which I'm gathering is right down there. So I'm gonna replace that y. I said negative 15, I meant negative square root of 15 fourths. So negative square root of 15 over four. I will misspeak. Quite often, I record so many videos that it's very easy to make a mistake in one of them. 
if not all of them. The one nice thing about unit cir circle trigonometry is once you have the point where your T terminates, then you have all the trig functions. I'm not a fan, I will just say this out loud, I am not a fan of unit circle trigonometry. It's just not my thing. I like right triangle trigonometry. However, it does have its strengths and there are some theoretical uh, ramifications that are necessary for us to know unit circle trigonometry. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about all the trig functions. Well, sine of t is supposed to be y. And the y value is negative square root of 15 over 4. The cosine of that arc t, same thing as that angle, remember, is equal to the x value, which we know is negative 1 fourth. They actually gave us that. And the tangent of t is y over x. And we have those, those values right here. So I'm gonna say that's a negative root 15 over four divided by a negative one over four. Both numbers are negative, so this is gonna be positive. You can multiply numerator and denominator by four and you will get the square root of 15. And then we know just from previous lectures that the reciprocal functions are literally the reciprocals of these. So the cosecant of t is gonna be a negative four over root 15. Again, you don't have to rationalize that denominator in my class. The reciprocal of the cosine is the secant of t, and that would be a negative 4. And finally, the reciprocal of the tangent is the cotangent, again, of t is going to be uh, 1 over root 15. Those are all the trig values of that angle or arc length t. There you go. That's how it's done. Again, I want to draw your attention to something here before I move away from this. Had I drawn in a right triangle here, so an altitude that's critical, an, uh, a vertical line going from the point to the x-axis, and then obviously finishing off the triangle. Had I done that, this is the y value, that's the x value. Notice that there's a right triangle, so x squared plus y squared would equal uh, the hypotenuse, which is 1. So x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. Great. And I could have just used right triangle trig if we had created a notation here. If I had known this angle and I could call it something. Well, technically, you can call this angle something. It's not t, technically. We can call it t hat, maybe. Just give it a different symbol. And then I could say, oh, the sine of t hat is the y value opposite over hypotenuse, y over 1. So the sine of t is y over 1, at least the sine of t hat. The cosine of t hat is adjacent, which is x, over hypotenuse, 1, x over 1, which again is what we have up there for the cosine. The tangent of that angle would be opposite over adjacent y over x, which is exactly what we have there. So again, this is kind of why I dislike unit circle trigonometry. It's because mostly trigonometry is dominated by right triangle trigonometry. Unit circle trig kind of muddies the waters a little bit, but still necessary content for us to cover. And what I find is a lot of Students who come into my calculus course from high school have learned unit circle trigonometry. They know how to write out the unit circle and write out certain ratios on it, um, but it's really a weak form of trig. I think it's much better for you to know right triangle, right tri triangle trigonometry. Hard for me to say that though. Because right triangle trigonometry and unit circle trigonometry are the same thing, all the old theorems we knew before still hold. The reciprocal identity still holds, so sine is 1 over cosecant, and cosecant is 1 over sine, and so on and so forth here. Also, the ratio identities still hold. Tangent is still sine over cosine. Cotangent is still cosine over sine. Those will become more important later on as we do proofs. Which brings me to a point here. The reason why I'm approaching trigonometry the way I am by teaching you how to compute 
the values of trigonometric functions first without any kind of massive theory in the background is because that's how you learn to deal with functions as well. When you learn what a function was, somebody said, oh, f of x. Um, well, it's a machine. You plug something in, you get something out. And then you had a long conversation about the theoretical structure of it, but you didn't do any advanced function analysis. You then started evaluating what's f of three and stuff like that. So that's basically what we're focusing on in our previous videos and this video is just getting used to the notation and evaluating. But trust me, as we move forward, we're gonna do a lot of stuff with trigonometric functions. Now I have mentioned the word quadrants a couple times already in this video, and I'm assuming you know what I mean, but if you don't, I'm just gonna define them very quickly. Given a Cartesian coordinate plane, this guy right here, it gets divided into four sections, which we call quadrants. The upper left-hand section is called quadrant one. I'm sorry, the upper right-hand section is called quadrant one. The upper left-hand section is called quadrant two. Notice it increases as you go counterclockwise, just like an angle increases as you go counterclockwise. The quadrant that's the lower left-hand quadrant is quadrant three. And then finally, the lower right-hand quadrant is quadrant four. So that's just a heads up. Those are how the quadrants are defined. And then we have this theorem about the signs, S-I-G-N signs, of the trigonometric functions in quadrants. So first of all, all trigonometric functions, all of them, of T and therefore of theta, are positive in quadrant one. So everything is quad positive in quadrant one. And that's because if you think about the definitions of the trig functions, which rather than hopping back and forth uh, and uh, between the definition and here, I'm just gonna go ahead and rewrite them. And I need only write the major three because the others are just reciprocals. And so their positivity or negativity uh, really relies upon these three. All right, so think about the X and Y values in quadrant one here. They're both positive. Because X is positive here, and because Y is positive here, all trig functions that rely upon X and Y, which they all do, uh, where, did they, where are they? They're way over there. You know what, I better rope them up and move them over. So all of these trig functions will be positive in quadrant one. So I'll write that down here all are positive here. In fact, we use the letter A for all. There we go. And let's see, in quadrant two, well, the X values over here are actually negative. The Y values in quadrant two are positive though. So let's see, the Y values are positive. The sign, what color did I use green? Okay. The sign is positive here. The cosine on the other hand has to be negative. And the tangent, because it's y over x, which is a positive value over a negative value, the tangent will be negative. So the only one that's positive here is the sine function. I'll use s for that. Although, actually, maybe I'll even write it in. I'll write sine. And I'll write over here all. All of them are positive there. Sine is positive there. Let's go to quadrant three. Well, in quadrant three, the x value is obviously negative. The y value is obviously negative as well. So sine, which is the y value, and cosine, which is the x value, they're both gonna be negative in quadrant three. However, the tangent, which is the ratio of the y and the x value, that's gonna be positive because it's a negative over a negative. So the tangent in this case is gonna be positive here. It's tangent, that's the positive one. By the way, when I say tangent, I mean tangent and the cotangent, it's reciprocal. Same thing, when I say sine, it's reciprocal, which is the cosecant, is also positive in quadrant two. All right, moving on to quadrant four, the x values here are positive, but the y values are negative. So if the y values are negative, sine is negative. If the x values are positive, the cosine is positive, so I'll write that in here, cosine. And let's see the tangent. Tangent's y over x, negative over positive. 
uh, that's going to be a negative number. So that's not going to work. So there you go. Those are the signs, S-I-G-N signs, of the trig functions based on where the uh, angle or the arc length terminates. So for example, if you have an angle and it terminates in quadrant one, you know whatever trig function you're working with, it'll be positive. If you have an angle that terminates in quadrant two, if it's a sine or a cosecant, it'll be positive. Otherwise, it'll be negative. If you have an angle that terminates in quadrant three, if it's tangent or cotangent, it'll be positive. Otherwise, it'll be a negative number. And again, finally, you have an angle that terminates in quadrant four. As long as it's a cosine or a secant, it will be a positive ratio. Otherwise, it'll be a negative number. And the mnemonic that people uh, remember with this is all students take calculus. There you go. This theorem just reiterates what I've said. The sine and cosecant are the only trigonometric functions that are positive in quadrant two and so on and so forth. We've actually proven it, so it's not much of a proof, but we've, we've at least justified it strongly. How's that? That is completely, by the way, memorizable. Most of the stuff that I'm stating here, you do have to commit to memory. So let's go ahead and use that idea. State the quadrant in which the terminal point determined by T, determine, let me read that again. State the quadrant in which the terminal point determined by T lies if, that just reads weird. Anyway, let's suppose that cosecant of T is negative and cotangent of T is positive. Where does T terminate? That would have been a much better way to write that. All right, so let's see. If the cosecant is negative, that means the sine is negative. Well, I have to know the sine is positive here and all of them are positive there. So, so far I know it's either quadrant three or four because that's where the sine is negative and therefore that's where the cosecant must be negative. So that's based on this. And now I'll use a different highlighter. Let's use blue. Uh, we know the cotangent has to be positive. Well, of those two quadrants, all students take calculus. So where take is, which is the, the third quadrant, that's where the cotangent is positive. So I know it's got to be the third quadrant. So therefore, the answer to this, quadrant three. Again, you want the sine to be negative because that's the reciprocal of the cosecant. And you want the tangent to be positive because that's a reciprocal of the cotangent that only occurs in quadrant three. Another quick example here. Suppose that cosine is a negative one ninth. Cosine of T is a negative one ninth. I'll highlight that. That's kind of important. And the sine of T is positive. Compute the values of the remaining trigonometric functions of T. A drawing almost always helps. So let's see, all students take calculus. I need the cosine to be negative. Well, that's not going to be in the fourth quadrant because that's where cosine is positive and it's not gonna be in the first quadrant because everything's positive there. So let's go ahead and highlight the two possible quadrants. But at the same time, I want the sine to be positive. Of those two quadrants, the sine is quadrant here, is positive there. So we know it's gonna be a quadrant two angle. I'm just gonna go ahead and state this as quadrant two. And you'll hear me say this quite a bit as we move forward. Trigonometry really boils down to two things, quadrants and reference angles. And right now we're not dealing with reference angles, but that's where we're heading. So right now, we know the quadrant, that's perfectly fine. They gave us the ratio. So we have some terminal point here in quadrant two, and they tell me the cosine of that, which is the X value. Notice I immediately go to my right triangle trig, but they tell me the cosine of this is negative one over nine, negative one over nine. Let me get rid of that T because it's hard for me to see. So I know the X value is negative one ninth. We just need to find out what the Y value is. Well, if it's on a unit circle, then 
To find the y value, we just need to deal with this formula. x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. Again, we're on the unit circle, supposedly. You actually don't need to be, but let's just pretend for a moment that we are. Well, if x is negative 1 ninth, then to find y, we do what we did before. Right? We subtract 181st from both sides, and you get 82. 80, whoops, 80, 81st. Sorry about that. And then you take the square root of both sides to find out that y is either, uh, let's see, square root of uh, 80 is 4, 16 times 5, so 4 root 5. Square root of 81 is 9. So it's either a positive or a negative, 4 root 5 over 9. Well, we can see we're in quadrant 2, so it's going to be a positive. And by the way, I'm not even using... Uh, there are a lot of different ways in trigonometry to use uh, the mathematics. I'm just using a triangle because it's just, well, super nice and easy way to do it. But anyhow, uh, finding the rest of the trig values. Well, let's see. The sine of t will be the y value. So that's going to be a positive 4 root 5 over 9. The cosine of t is the x value, which we know to be a negative 1 ninth. The tangent of t is going to be the y value. 4 root 5 over 9, divided by the x value a negative 1 ninth. Multiply both sides by a 9, or both, sorry, numerator and denominator by a 9, you'll get a negative 4 root 5. And then the reciprocal functions. The cosecant of t is just 9 over 4 root 5. The secant of t is a negative 9. And finally, the cotangent of t is going to be a negative one over four root five. Again, I don't rationalize denominators here. Now, something I wanna draw your attention to before we step away from this, um, we have another couple pages, but something I wanna talk about with this one specifically. I could have done this problem without unit circle and I basically did. If I told you I had an angle that terminated in quadrant two, well then, you could draw out an angle that terminates in quadrant two. Yay, there we are. But notice if I terminate that ray at a point, so I create a line segment, I could draw out a right triangle. And if I said this angle was T, I could say, well, this angle is some other angle. It's related to T actually somehow like if t was 170 degrees well then t hat is 180 minus 170 or 10 degrees they're related to each other somehow but if i told you the cosine of the angle was negative one over nine i could use my right triangle trig to say well the cosine of our angle is a negative one over nine in other words if if I look at, now this is a little bit of hand waving, I'm not proving anything yet, but I could look at this angle instead and say the adjacent side is a negative one and the hypotenuse is nine because cosine's adjacent over hypotenuse. If I did it that way, this side would be 80. Nope, it would be square root of 80 because using Pythagorean theorem, you get 81 minus one, square root of 81 minus one is square root of 80, which would be four root five. Now, if I just use that triangle to answer this question, what's the sine, which is opposite over hypotenuse, four root five over nine? Notice that's the sign that we got up there. If I said, what's the cosine? it's adjacent over hypotenuse, negative one over nine. Notice that's the same cosine up above. Tangent is opposite over, oops, over adjacent. There we go, which is a negative four root five, which is exactly what we got up above. So there are a couple ways you could do this. You could use right triangle trig or unit circle trigonometry. I, like I said, I'm a huge fan of right triangle trig, but there's a little bit of hand waving that I'm doing here um, that I don't want you to believe 100%. For example, I'm actually finding the sines and cosines of that angle t hat. 
So I need to convince you of the relationship between T and T hat. And I haven't done that yet. So it's a little bit illegal for me to have just jumped in here and said, oh, look, this triangle, I could have written it this way and yada, yada, yada. Um, but also another thing I'm kind of hand waving is that right triangles don't have negative lengths. So this floor length here, the horizontal length, normally a right triangle would not have a length of negative one for a side, but it really works beautifully with right triangle trig if you just imagine it could. Anyhow, that's a little aside. I'm still going to work with unit circle trig for a while, but eventually I just seep my, I seep into right triangle trig out of habit. The last two topics are the domains and the ranges of the trigonometric functions. Now, <clears throat> I just want to convince you of the domain and range here rather than prove I'm just going to do a strong convincing. How's that? So I'm going to go down here and I'm going to draw in. If you've wondered how I get such straight, beautiful lines, I use a ruler. So there we go. And if you're wondering how I get such beautiful circles, I use a protractor. There we go. And I'll use blue for this. All the way around. Isn't that fun? All right. So uh, let's talk about the trig functions here and why the domains of the trig functions are what they are. So it tells me the domain of the sine and the cosine are all real numbers. Well, remember the sine and the cosine are, let me go ahead and write this in here. The sine of the arc length or the angle is equal to Y and the cosine of the arc length or the angle in a unit circle is equal to X. Well, if you take a look at it, no matter what angle I look at, there are X and Y values on that unit circle. So no matter what angle I plug in, no matter how large of a T value I go around, I go around 3000 times, no matter what I do, I will have a terminal point on the side there that has an X and a Y value. So the domain, what I can plug in for the arc length can be anything I want. So domain of sine and cosine, all real numbers. The tangent, on the other hand, and the secant, on the other hand, are somewhat limited because the tangent is y over x and the secant is 1 over x. Those don't exist when x is 0. And x is 0 right here and right here. And that happens at an arc length or angle of pi over two. So that would be that angle right there is pi over two or the angle of three pi over two angle or arc length three pi over two. By the way, it's not only pi over two and three pi over two, it's any rotation after that. So a better way to write that is to say, I know the X values are zero if I rotate to angle pi over two. Everybody just nod your head. You totally agree with that. If you rotate through an angle of pi over two, you're pointing right at this edge and the X value right there is zero. So tangent would have division by zero. So would the secant. Great. What if I were to add pi to that? So I stop there and then I add a pi. Notice where I land. I land at the edge with another X value of a zero. What if I add pi to that? Well, I land at another edge with the X value zero. What if I add pi to that? I land at another edge where the X value is zero. So because of that, the domain of the tangent and the secant functions are all real numbers other than pi over two plus any rotation of pi. And because they're on different lines, I'm gonna rewrite it. I'll just say, X, uh, T, sorry, T cannot be pi over two plus any rotation of pi. I'll just say where N is in the integers. That's what that double bar Z means is that N is an integer. So N is one, two, three, four, or negative one, negative two or zero. Um, so you can't park yourself a pi over two and then rotate by 180 degrees. Cause you'll just end at a value at an angle where you've rotated to pi over two and then add pi, you're still at a place where the X value is zero. 
Now, what about the domains of the cotangent and cosecant? Well, the cosecant of T is the reciprocal of the sine, which is therefore going to be 1 over y. And the cotangent is the reciprocal of the tangent, so therefore is x over y. Notice the cosecant and cotangent are undefined when y is 0. Or in other words, when we're on the x-axis. So either at this point, 1, 0, or this point, negative 1, 0. So either at 0, t equals 0, or t equals pi, or t equals 2 pi, or t equals 3 pi, or t equals 4 pi, or t equals 6 pi, 7 pi, 8, whatever it is, right? I think I miscounted. Anyway, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi, 6 pi, 7 pi, 8 pi, 9 pi. Well, anyway, you get the idea. It's any multiple of pi is an issue. So, domain of the cotangent, cosecant, are all real numbers other than n pi, where, again, n is an element of the integers. So you cannot, so there are domain restrictions because on the, on the reciprocal functions and on tangent, because you have division by zero at certain points. So there's the domain theorem. We'll reference that quite often. And strangely, we will reference the range theorem quite often as well. And I say strangely because often up to this point, at least in mathematics, you've dealt with range of functions but you haven't really like yeah it's not like the domain you've dealt with domain quite a bit but range hasn't come into play until now with trig functions range is critical so let's go back here and uh go ahead and mention again i'll just quickly write these down the sine of our angle is y at least on the unit circle Cosine of our angle is x, again, only for the unit circle. And the tangent of our angle is y over x. That's actually always true. All right. So let's see. On this unit circle, what do the y values range between? What's the highest y value? What's the lowest y value? If you said lowest is negative 1, the highest is positive 1, you're absolutely right. And the same is true for the x values. They go from negative 1 to 1. That's critical. The range of the sine and the cosine functions are negative one to one, including negative one and including positive one. Now, the others are a little harder to see, but the tangent, well, this is such a, I'm, I'm such a fan of the tangent that I just want to talk about this for the moment. So let's suppose that this is your terminal point right here. Tangent is the Y value divided by the X value. Or in other words, it's rise over run. The tangent's actually the slope of that line. That's what's crazy. The tangent is the slope of that, it's rise over run. It's the slope of that line. That's all the tangent is. Well, if I kept rotating that curve, that line, if I kept moving that point maybe to here, no, that's not large enough, maybe to here. No, that's not steep enough, but maybe a little bit steeper and so on and so forth. How steep can that line get? It can get infinitely steep. Like this is a slope right here of one. Here's a slope of maybe two. Here's a slope of maybe five. Here's a slope of maybe 10. Here's a slope of a hundred. Here's a slope of a thousand. It goes to infinity. So the tangent, which is the slope of the line, goes from a slope of zero all the way to infinity and actually can be negative. All the way down to negative infinity could be those slopes. So the tangent, its range is negative infinity to positive infinity. And that's why I say right here, the tangent and technically the cotangent, because that's also a slope style, their ranges are negative infinity to positive infinity or all real numbers. Now the secant and cosecant functions, I'm going to hold off on that only because it's better to see those in a graph. So I will go ahead and stop here and not talk about the secants and the cosecants until we move forward. I just find that it works a little bit better. Plus, honestly, this video has been long enough. I'm sure that you are tired of hearing my voice and I am extremely tired of talking. So you guys have a wonderful afternoon, evening or morning or middle of the night if that's when you're watching this. And I'll see you in the next video. 
the system of equations. We must deal with them all at once. Always looking for solutions. Positive outlook overcomes obstacles getting in our way. Cause effects more than we can sometimes see. Things for what they are and work together until you feel at peace. Listen close. Don't talk too much. That isn't kosher. You may really hurt inside. It doesn't justify you to speak too loud and cry. Don't.